the uh, field of optics is pretty old and, and heaven knows goes back uh, no doubt before the Greeks but we didn't really begin to learn anything much about light uh, until maybe a couple of hundred years ago. Around about the beginning of the 19th century, everything began to change. And it became clear that, that light is a kind of wave. What kind of a wave it was <laughs> stayed mysterious for another 60 or 70 years. But meanwhile, there were all these discoveries being made of everything having to do with electricity and magnetism. And uh, it was finally all put together in the 1860s by an Englishman, uh, James Clark Maxwell. It became clear that, that light is a kind of electromagnetic wave, and uh, the equations that governed uh, electricity and magnetism were really put together and even added to significantly by Maxwell, so that the whole thing really seemed to be quite perfect uh, through the rest of the 19th century and uh, even into the 20th century. But then it became clear around the beginning of the 20th century that there was still a lot missing. And what was missing had to do with quanta, with the fact that uh, light doesn't behave just like a wave, uh, but it behaves as if it were a shower of particles as well. And even much more importantly, there is something very subtle. These are not material particles in the usual sense. And they're a funny compromise between waves and particles. And you see remarkably contrasting sorts of behavior, even within a single kind of experiment. Once you've, once you've devised the experiments cleverly enough. But all of this stayed mysterious uh, for still some years. And uh, uh, the strange thing was that, that these discoveries made with light became the model for discoveries about the nature of matter. That matter behaved like waves. Well, that really uh, shocked everyone in the middle 1920s, and uh, uh, at that point, uh, it was still unclear what was the fundamental nature of light. Uh, that is to say, the, these compromises between the behavior of waves and particles, compromises and I should say contrasts as well. So it became crystal clear suddenly in about 19, 1928. In 1928, it was Paul Dirac who showed finally that the equations for light, which uh, had been thought to, behave, to, to deal with, with continuous behavior, were not yet complete. And you had to add to this earlier picture of light the notion that uh, light has this, this behavior that compromises between particles and waves. And uh, uh, that became baffling for some time, but uh, it seemed to explain everything. It involved some difficult mathematics, and that is what has kept us busy for the years since 1928. You could say that all of optics is, in effect, quantum optics. Quantum optics is the, the aspect of optics that, that deals with the behavior of light uh, as broken up into individual quanta. And with these quanta behaving, uh, I would have to say, rather strangely. That got figured out, at least in, in elementary mathematical terms, uh, by the 1930s. Uh, the theory worked pretty well in all of the simple examples, but there was very little attention paid to the behavior of uh, 
uh, large numbers of light quanta. And the fact is that all the light we see contains very large numbers of quanta. Sometimes these large numbers of quanta behave so continuously that you uh, can't distinguish their behavior from the behavior described already long before by Maxwell. But there are many contexts, there are many different sorts of experiments in which uh, we see much more intimately the interaction between light and the atoms that radiate light or scatter it or absorb it, whatever they do. Whenever we see those interactions more intimately, it's the quantum nature of light, the fact that light is divided into quanta that uh, is absolutely necessary to explain what's going on. So that's what quantum optics ultimately has to do with. Uh, it, quantum optics isn't necessary in order to explain all the behaviors of light that we see daily. Most of those were explained long ago. But all of the all of the intimate interactions between uh, light and, and the atoms of matter, all of those interactions do require quantum optics for their explanation. And uh, some of them have raised considerable puzzles, at least from an everyday standpoint. The interesting things are not the kind of chaos that you can get when uh, uh, quanta are behaving more or less randomly. Uh, the people who uh, deal with a form of light called radio waves, it's, it's uh, of course very long wavelength light and so has nothing to do with visible light, they are accustomed to coherent signals, radio, television, all of the things we use to uh, communicate by means of, of radio, that form of light. Uh, all of those are ones in which the quanta behave coherently. The quanta are all doing more or less the same thing instead of just behaving randomly. When quanta behave randomly, well, that's an idealization of, of what uh, the radio people call noise. <laughs> There's an awful lot of noise in the world, and uh, uh, a great deal of attention these days is, is directed toward developing coherence. And coherence is, tends to be the situation in which light quanta are all uh, behaving more or less similarly and, and regularly uh, so that there is something really predictable about their behavior. Predictability is the very essence of communication. <laughs> without predictability, without that kind of regularity, you just don't have communication, for example. Coherence is something we've, we've really been learning about in uh, the last decades and uh, what it is and, and uh, uh, how you develop it. My own work has had to do uh, originally in this field, I, I have to say I've worked in several others, it has to do with the quantum theory of optical coherence. That's, that's what it's called. And uh, it's, uh, it, it deals with the question of how do you get all of these light quanta behaving in similar and uh, largely predictable ways. The field, I must say, has developed empirically as well as theoretically. And the, uh, the greatest of the achievements in, in developing the field empirically was the development of the laser. Now, curiously, the laser was a device which was developed really in stages. It started with a, uh, a low frequency, long wavelength version, uh, which uh, was developed uh, by uh, a number of people, including Purcell and Ed Purcell from here and Felix Bloch. 
These were people who discovered uh, after the Second World War that one of the uses of radar was to, uh, to use these microwaves to communicate coherently with nuclei, with nuclear magnetism, in fact. And uh, they uh, uh, developed, and others helped develop from that, uh, these microwave radiators, uh, which really never uh, existed at such short wavelengths, uh, they uh, were, in a sense, marching toward uh, the very short wavelengths of visible light. But there was no way of generating any intensity of... of uh, uh, visible light that had this remarkable property of coherence. And uh, the guy who did it more than anyone else was Charles Townes uh, with the invention of the laser. Before that, of course, you had the maser, which he had, and others had worked on, which was the microwave device, or generating coherent microwave beams. What Townes did was to uh, succeed in doing that with visible light, which is quite short wavelength. He did that with a considerable understanding of, of the interaction between uh, light quanta and matter. But the curious thing is that his theory, as far as uh, light was concerned, was the classical theory of the electromagnetic field. Uh, he uh, worked out a scheme, in theoretical terms, in which atoms interacted with this classical field and on that basis was able to uh, develop the laser, but I'd have to tell you it involved a certain amount of guesswork uh, and a lot of uh, un many unsolved mathematical problems. Then my own intervention at a somewhat later stage was to provide uh, the quantum theory of the coherence that the laser develops. So there it is in a nutshell. <laughs> in a sense, it's the statistical theory of how light quanta behave, but the statistical theory is not just the theory of counting things. You surely know what statistics is in terms of populations, but we're not talking about populations here. We're talking about things which may or may not exist. And uh, developing uh, the statistics of quantum optics is a matter of developing a new kind of statistics in which uh, you're dealing with things which uh, in a sense, partially exist or may exist in other forms, and you've got to take all of that into account. Uh, we know in quantitative terms how to deal with it, but it takes a kind of mathematics which is really rather different from everyday mathematics and certainly from everyday statistics. <laughs>